Good afternoon, everyone. I take this moment to welcome you to our service today as we gather together to pause and to remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf as we gather at the foot of the cross. It truly is my hope and prayer that our time this day is one which will allow us to spend some time in thought, in thankfulness, and even as we recall such a horrific event that we will be able to gather in celebration of a love that was poured out for us so freely. I would like to take this opportunity to thank those who are participating in this service today, those who will be sharing uh, the message and those who will be sharing their gift of music. I would extend a welcome to those of you who are listening now on VOWR and those of you who are joining in on our live stream on Facebook and YouTube. And we truly do hope that you feel a part of what we share in this day and that this service will prove to be a blessing for us all. I will share with you just a reminder that we will be gathering again tomorrow evening uh, to celebrate an Easter Eve vigil at St. James United Church beginning at 7 o'clock. And I'm hoping that you will be able to come along and to share in that as again we spend some time in thought and in meditation. As we gather together as Christ's body, I would extend to you an invitation now before we begin the formal aspect of our worship to take just a moment as you are comfortable to turn to the person beside you, behind you, across from you with a handshake, a smile. Let us welcome each other to this time and let us share with one another the peace of Christ. Let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ. We gather to remember the overwhelming evidence of love's ultimate sacrifice. Who would have guessed that the height and depth, the length and width of God's love might look like this, a forsaken savior on a cross? Certainly not us, not us who are too often lost amid the world's distractions and responsibilities not us for whom such love was offered without cost. Let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ and commit ourselves to remember the price paid. Let us live our lives in a way that indicates why this Friday is called good. Thanks be to God who opened the gates of heaven that we might have the faith, hope, and love witnessed in Christ's sacrifice for our salvation. Let us pray. The darkness may try to hide it, God, but this is truly Good Friday, a day of endless miracle, of incredible wonder, that you would welcome the beam to your shoulders and beckon the nails to your flesh, to crucify darkness in your own fragmented body, that you would hold the gaze of hatred, look boldly in the face of evil, and speak the soft words of forgiveness that you would embrace in your paralyzed arms your hardened companion in death and all who would seek comfort in you, promising a world made new and an eternity brought into the present moment. Yes, absolutely, a day of wonders and miracles, and we are in awe, not before its horror, but its beauty. Amen.
Please be seated. <clears throat> See the one stricken for the transgression of others and weep. Come to the one bruised for our iniquities and wonder at so great a love. Feel the oppression of sin and come to confess it before the one by whose stripes we are healed. Let us pray. We confess to you, our Lord and Savior, that we have betrayed and denied you, forgotten and doubted you. When our faith is tested, we wonder where you are. When we see injustice in the world, we often stand by. We turn our backs and we ignore the cries of others. We confess that again and again we deny you and betray you with our silence when we fail to proclaim your good news, when we fail to live out your teachings and love our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, O God, and help us to truly repent. Help us to remember your sacrifice, your love, and to know your forgiveness. In the name of the one who lived, who was crucified, and who lives again, Jesus the Messiah, we pray. Amen. Jesus bore the sins of many and is the source of eternal salvation to all who hear and obey. God will deliver you and renew your strength. Trust in God and you will not be disappointed. We hear the truth of God and bear witness to its transforming power. We are loved and forgiven people. Thanks be to God. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. I die that thou might live. 
Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. Thank you, Bill, for inviting us to be here with you this day. I invite you to turn in your bulletins and join with me in the prayer. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of forgiveness spoken in love. Touch our hearts with the hope that is found in Jesus' word, that we may rise beyond the horror of these events to see the promise of this day. Amen. And our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, reading in chapter 23, verses 32 to 35. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Over the years, the faithful have heard many sermons about the cruelty of crucifixion as a method of death. And as we begin our meditations today, let me set the scene and bring you back to that barren hillside, to those three hideous trees garishly decorated with the bodies of men. In your mind, picture Jesus on the cross, not the healthy, sanitized version of some paintings or sculptures or the wholesome victory of a resurrection cross, but the dirty, smelly, disgusting reality. About 45 years ago in 1979, I served a summer field in La Fleche, Saskatchewan. And the Roman Catholic Church in the next town called Gravelberg was a national historic site. Actually, a few years ago, Johnny Harris set one of his still standing uh, shows there, and I watched it eagerly to see if it featured the church. It did, and it was as powerful as I remembered. The beautiful and dramatic stations of the cross in the church had been lovingly painted on linoleum, of all things, by a very artistic priest who had been there in the 1930s in the Depression. And I visited to admire his work because everyone spoke of it and it was the thing to do. But I returned to sit in front of the cross. I'd never seen anything like it. The cross supported a life-size, well, presumably life-size, plaster Jesus. His back was ripped by the whipping. His brow was bloodied by the crown of thorns. His knees were scraped raw and embedded with gravel from his stumbles on the road. His hands and his feet bearing the cruel marks of the nails. His side was pierced by the spear. All those signs of that journey to Calvary. But then it was his eyes, his eyes showing his pain and his utter exhaustion. But somehow, the artist was marvelous. He showed that they were shining 
with compassion. Now, this cross was not, you know, set up high, far away from us in the pews, protecting us from its brutal reality. Instead, it was mounted on the church's back wall with Jesus' feet only a little above the floor. And as I looked at it, I could hear the flies buzzing. I could smell the blood and the sweat, and I could see the incredible suffering. It was unavoidable. It was overwhelming. And that is the vision I want you to keep in your mind through our journey today. Today, as we see Jesus racked in pain, we are amazed that his first act as we practice it was to think of others. Rising above his suffering, he prays not for personal relief, but that God would forgive them. And although the Bible mentions forgive and forgive and given and forgiveness about 200 times, we might think, surely not here, not now. We are touched and awed by the demonstration of grace and mercy well beyond our comprehension. Most of us find it much easier to condemn than to praise or to forgive. When someone cuts us off in traffic or steals that vaunted parking spot, well, when we feel wronged or, or, excuse me, or we feel disrespected in any way, Father, forgive them are not the first words out of our mouth. We're more likely to call on God's wrath in words that I wouldn't dare repeat in church. And if you think the number of shaking fists and angry words and loud voices that surround us daily show us how upset people get at slights, whether real or imagined. And the bile that is expressed on social media is overwhelming. Parents have to protect their children from it. But how much greater is the pain when there are real wrongs that have been committed? Now, we live in the real world where, you know, forgiveness comes at 22 minutes at the end of every situational comedy, or after an hour or two in a drama or a movie, or in the soap operas. Well, people can hold on to anger and resentment until the storyline changes, and it calls for forgiveness. But real forgiveness for real pain is different. It's a decision that you will no longer resent the actions of another, And in doing so, you become freed to no longer carry the weight of anger or resentment or bitterness or indignation. It may be allowing yourself to believe that perhaps the person who wronged you in traffic had a good reason, rushing home to feed a child. That your child is sorry for disobeying you that your friend is truly repentant for betraying your trust, and that those unjustly killing you have no idea what they have done. After some terrible event in our society, when innocent people are harmed or even killed, there's an outpouring of grief and anger and disbelief, and sometimes a very quick, assigning of blame. And sometimes we hear that people who were harmed or who lost loved ones have forgiven their perpetrators. And they soften cite their faith as the source of strength allowing them to forgive. But then we hear the scoffers. We hear those who are unable to accept that the idea of forgiveness is real or even possible. They don't understand that forgiveness is an important concept and a very important action for those who believe. While the words of forgiveness may be said soon after an event, they are just the starting point. The reality of actually forgiving deep in your heart and in your spirit may take a long time and a lot of work, but that is your intention. And it shows that you are willing to pay the price that forgiveness extracts on the forgiver. 
I believe Jesus paid that price, for in asking God to forgive others, he revealed the depths of his own compassion. Well, today, perhaps we think of those standing by Calvary who needed God's forgiveness. The first one that pops to my mind, of course, is Peter. It's always Peter. But Peter, fresh from his three denials of knowing Jesus, in spite of all his previous claims of devotion and loyalty, he and those who had run away in the night from the Garden of Gethsemane were acutely aware of their sin as they struggled back to join the followers at the cross and in the days beyond. How wonderful those words of forgiveness must have sounded in their ears and in their hearts. Among those in the crowd were those who still had the green stains of palm branches on their hands and whose voices were hoarse from shouting, Crucify him! They were there for the spectacle. The more disinterested observers included those who were, you know, just doing their duty. They saw the day as one more on the job, not particularly pleasant, but hardly memorable. There were the soldiers who had mocked him and crowned him with thorns and drove nails into his flesh and then gambled for his robe. They may even have been angry at Jesus and at the thieves that they drew death duty that day. Imagine standing in the open sun in the hot Middle Eastern weather, exposed to the biting sandy wind, and it could not have been an easy assignment. There was no honor, no glory in killing a beaten, unarmed man. A soldier should kill in battle where there is honor and glory. And then there was the Jewish hierarchy those who had plotted his downfall. Well, they self-righteously thought that they were protecting the faith from this false prophet, and they were saving their fellow Jews from being led down the road to blasphemy. They may have tossed their heads in disbelief, thinking, ha, who does this guy think he is calling on God for forgive us? God should forgive him for all the trouble that he has caused. I often hope that maybe, maybe one or two came to doubt and eventually repent of their actions this day, perhaps following the the trail that was blazed by their colleague Nicodemus. The government officials that were here went along with the deal as a small price to pay for peace and goodwill. They also needed forgiveness, although perhaps only Pilate's wife knew how much. And then, and then there was Judas. Some people are not willing to believe that, that, Judas, that for Judas, forgiveness is possible, including Judas himself, if we are to judge by the stories of his suicide. But if we think that God cannot forgive Judas, who was truly sorry for the results that his actions had brought about, then we are limiting the power and the mercy of God. And that's a long sermon for another day. Oh, so easy for us to sit here and say, boy, you got it right, Karen. Boy, those, those people really needed to be forgiven. And wasn't it marvelous for Jesus that he would make that prayer to God in his agony? But what about us? Are we not among the them that Jesus asked God to forgive? So much of what these sinners did is what we do every day. The days when we take the easy, peaceful way out. The days when we try to force God's hand as Judas did. The days when, like the disciples, we come crawling back repentantly, seeking that forgiveness. And all too often, we sin without realizing how much we have hurt God. And Jesus said, for they know not what they do. Perhaps someday we will know, we will understand. But now, now when we believe that we are in the right, like the authorities and like the soldiers, 
We just keep pounding in those nails. Now, ministers usually end a service with a a benediction, inviting us to go out into the world to serve others, to go out in peace. And often on Good Friday, as we will today, there is no benediction. But on Good Friday, I often have a malediction that I found many years ago, and I want to share it with you, although this is not the end of the service, because those words just speak to me so deeply. Today, I would send you out disturbed and unsettled. Do not suppose that you have no part in the evil which hung Christ on that cross. Let us not presume to know God's love if there is any hateful thought in our hearts. Let us not presume to know the grace of Christ, even in this community where his body is divided and his people will not share a sanctuary, let alone his table in unity. And let us not presume to know the guidance of the Spirit if we are so sure of our own wisdom that we are not prepared to listen to the Spirit-inspired wisdom of those who know our one holy and eternal God by other names. Go from the comfort of this sanctuary into the God-forsaken places. Study the faces of ignorant and hate, want and fear. And with all of those whose lives are lived in darkness, hope for the dawn. Yes, we need that forgiveness too, for we are also the walking wounded and the worried well. Let us pray. Loving God, Today we gather, remembering the great sacrifice and the great gifts of Good Friday. Help us to grow in faith, mature in wisdom, and persevere in good works, that your forgiveness and grace are shown in our living every day to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us join together in prayer. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of promise. In this word may we know within our hearts the cross is not the end, that beyond the cross and the crosses of our lives, true paradise is to be found in your presence and your love. Amen. This is a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, beginning at the 39th verse. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. As we contemplate the last words of Jesus today, I'm sure you'll note that we hear from multiple Gospels. From Luke, as we just heard, plus Matthew, and from John. And each offers a view, a perspective on Jesus' crucifixion. Now, I'm a big proponent of reading from one author so we can appreciate what they are trying to tell us over a whole narrative. And yet, on a day like today, reading the Gospels beside each other can give us additional insight. And that was certainly the case for me as I prepared to preach on the second word, the word of promise. We hear Luke on this day because he gives us a whole dialogue between Jesus and the two criminals with whom Jesus was crucified. Mark tells us simply that Jesus was crucified with a couple of bandits. Matthew says that those bandits taunted Jesus. But Luke gives us detail describing what they said and how, as we heard, the second criminal rebuked the first, turning to Jesus and asking that Jesus remember him. And, of course, to which Jesus promises that he will be with him in paradise. It's a touching word. It's a powerful word. But what does it mean? I know that I got stuck on one word, paradise. Who doesn't want to be in paradise, I thought. It made me think of heaven, an idea reinforced by the fact that the two, crimp, the two people crucified with Jesus are criminals, and so Jesus is perhaps offering them forgiveness, which enables them to get to heaven. But that line of reasoning is filled with judgments about these people. And I wonder, what if statements about them being criminals or bandits is just to say how people viewed Jesus? It's not about these other two at all. Like when in Jesus' life they would judge him as a sinner, 
because he ate with sinners. And that reminded me how Jesus' teaching was much more centered on this life than the next life. And that left me even more unsure about what this word is supposed to mean. And I scrambled to make sense of it. So I looked at John, which we heard at the beginning of our liturgy. And I was struck by the brevity of what John says for this portion of the narrative. Simply this, that Jesus was crucified with two others. Just a shared experience. Nothing more. And that's when a light bulb flashed above my head. And I reconsidered the word that I'd been stuck on, that word paradise. There are two other ways in which the word paradise is used in the biblical narrative. First, there is the garden of creation. Adam and Eve in relationship with God in harmony with each other, in loving companionship with all of creation. And then there's the story of a beggar named Lazarus, who though abandoned in this life when he dies, is held in the bosom of Abraham. And what links these together is their focus on relationships. And I realize in that moment that the paradise that Jesus is speaking of was not some future reality, but a relationship in that moment on the cross. The focus of this word of promise then for me is really less about paradise and more you will be with me. And I'm comforted to hear that. To hear that I don't need to wait for a future heaven. That Jesus is always with us. And most especially in the most difficult of times. Because he's shared all that we experience already including the most ignoble of deaths. Jesus promises that the criminal will be with him in paradise because he is already with him. Jesus joined to him with love, with compassion, with understanding. Clearly, John has it right. Jesus was crucified with others. And in this, Jesus shows us a way into paradise in this life. Now, I can't speak for you, but I know for myself that I try to avoid suffering as much as I can. And Jesus invites us to accept it. Now, on this, I don't mean to seek it out, but not to avoid it either. The only way we can be freed from the suffering of our lives, suffering that we will inevitably experience at some point, is to pass through it. And sadly, when we try to bypass it, we usually end up hurting others and hurting ourselves. I find this to be the case, especially when I distance myself from others out of fear of suffering, out of fear of getting hurt, even if it's just the inevitability of grief when they die. But when I accept that suffering is part of living, that suffering is part of loving, I end up living and loving more fully, more deeply. I can be present to someone in their pain, in their suffering and lift some of it from them in that solidarity. And they do the same for me. And this 
becomes paradise as we share in loving solidarity with each other. And in the center of this is a final promise from Jesus. A promise to be with us even if no one else is. And with us in the one moment that no one else can accompany us through. At the moment of our own death. In that moment, he is there as he was for the ones with whom he was crucified, as well as he was there for his disciples, as well as he was there for the leaders, as well as he was there for the soldiers, as well as he has always been with us, with love, with compassion, with understanding. We will be with him in paradise because he has always been with us in life, in death, in life after death, present in our relationships, present as we pass through suffering, simply present now and always. Let us pray. God of love, compassion, understanding. In Jesus, you draw near to us. Joined in solidarity in all of the moments of our lives. Including the most difficult and troubling. May we trust that in him, you are always with us that shared relationship, the truest promise of paradise. Amen.
Let us pray. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of compassion. In this word, may we be witness to the love which looks beyond its own need to address the needs of others and find the courage to do the same. Amen. John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister Mary, wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The word of compassion. Jesus' third word from the cross, reminding us that we are to show compassion and love to all who are around us. My dear friends, this love story between Jesus and his mother began 33 years ago when a young Jewish girl by the name of Mary was visited by the Archangel Gabriel, who told her that she was going to give birth to a son, a very special son. It was not going to be an ordinary birth in the town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem, not far from Jerusalem, where we find Jesus this day, where this scene is unfolding on the hill of of Golgotha. Most of the male disciples had deserted Jesus, but not the three Marys who were standing there at the foot of the cross. Jesus' mother Mary, whose heart is broken, 44 years ago, on Good Friday, I was in Jerusalem. I walked the Via Della Rosa. I stood overlooking the hill of Golgotha. The reality of that story on that day played out before my eyes. Mary, standing there with the two other women. I know that we, that a number of women today are here attending this service. More women than men. That's not surprising in our church today. Here in this beautiful sanctuary. And I know that there are many other women who are viewing this service at home. Many of you are mothers, and you know the experience of giving birth to a child. To hear those first cries, to hold your baby for the first time after carrying them for nine months, to feel their tiny body now close to your own body, 
and begin the bonding with your child, which will continue throughout the rest of your life's journey. I'm reminded today that my own precious mother, Ina, is 96 years old and still living in our family home. I'm reminded that I'm the eldest of eight children she gave birth to, and I am very aware of the strong bond which developed in childhood and continues throughout the years. I've been privileged to know this wonderful, precious gift of love of my mother. I am sure that many of you are now thinking about the gift of your own mother's love if you were privileged to have that deep love of your mother. As Mary stood at the foot of the cross, she may have been remembering a time when she and her partner Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. They had brought Jesus there for the act of purification as required by the law of Moses. In that temple, they met an elderly man named Simeon, and Simeon requested that he might be able to hold the baby Jesus. He said something that day that amazed and frightened Mary. Luke chapter 2, beginning at the 28th verse. He took him in his arms, praising God and saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The child's mother and father were amazed at what Simon was saying about their son. Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary, Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And looking directly into Mary's eyes, he said, A sword will pierce your own soul too. A sword will pierce your own soul too. My friends, Mary had no way of knowing that day how painful that sword would indeed pierce her soul. We know very little about the development of the relationship between Jesus and his mother. Scripture provides very few details of their 33-year journey. We can be sure, though, a strong bond developed between them. They loved each other deeply. Mary's heart was breaking as she witnessed her beloved son enduring a mocking trial, being whipped, dragging a wooden cross to the streets of Jerusalem, being nailed to a cruel Roman cross, and named as a criminal. But Mary knew he was no criminal. How could these Roman soldiers be crucifying her beloved son? Mary's heart was breaking as she stood there at the foot of the cross with two of her close female friends. You know, women 
know how to support each other. They know how to support each other much better than we of the male species. Mary was standing there with two of her friends. One can only imagine the tears of anger, despair, helplessness, and deep sorrow that flowed down their faces that day. Jesus is nearing the time of his death. Yet even in this moment, he is moved to compassion. Jesus shows his humanity when he looks down from the cross and sees his dear mother standing there. Jesus knew the deep emotional pain that she was going through. His heart was breaking also knowing that he was dying and must leave his dear mother. Jesus knew the Ten Commandments from his Jewish faith, and especially the Fifth Commandment, honor your father and mother. It seems that his father, Joseph, had died earlier and did not have to endure this painful scene. Jesus could see one of his disciples, the one he loved. Scholars think it was John, standing there with the three women at the foot of the cross. Jesus knew that he could no longer take care of his mother. He found the energy and the strength to speak to his mother that day. It is interesting that he refers to Mary as woman in this last brief conversation from the cross. Maybe, friends, maybe he used the term woman because he could not say mother at that painful painful moment. Woman, here is your son. And he said to his beloved disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Friends, there were no Canada pension in those days in Israel. No Canada pension. Families had to look after each other. Jesus knew that he could not fulfill his obligation to care for his mother any longer. He knew that John would have concern and the means to care for her, John would show her compassion and accept the challenge to care for Mary after her son's death. As they left Golgotha on that dark day with heavy hearts, John immediately invited Mary into his home and accepted to care for her as his own Mother. William Barclay, in his commentary on John's Gospel, writes There is something infinitely moving in the fact that Jesus, in the agony of the cross, in the moment when salvation of the whole world hung in balance, Thoughts of the loneliness of his mother in those days when he was taken away filled him with compassion for her. Jesus never forgot the duty that lay in his hands. He was Mary's eldest son. And even in the moment of his cosmic battle, he never forgot the simple thing that lay near home. To the end of the day, 
even on the cross, Jesus was thinking more of the sorrow of others than his own. My dear friends in Christ, this emotional moving drama unfolding between Jesus and his mother Mary and his close friend John has a very important lesson to teach each one of us on this Good Friday. And the lesson is that we are to care for our mothers and fathers. We are to care for our neighbors. We are to care for those entrusted to our care. Many of them in distant places around this world. Not only our own parents, but also the many mothers and fathers who are suffering in this province and throughout the world. We hear about the housing crisis for many people in Canada and throughout the world today. We know that there are mothers in our province who cannot find a place to call home today because of the high cost of rent and the shortage of affordable housing. We watch pictures of mothers and their children in places like the Ukraine and Gaza and Sudan and Haiti crying out for food and for a safe place to live. Jesus would say to us from the cross, here is your mother. I can no longer provide the care. Now I give this mandate to you, my people. We have the mandate to care for the widow, the homeless, the hungry, knowing that many of these people are someone's mother. In closing, throughout the many years that I have worked in chaplaincy, I have witnessed many mothers sitting by the bedside of ill sons and daughters. Some of these mothers were accompanying their 33-year-old sons whose bodies were ravaged by cancer and other diseases. The strong bond of mother's love continues throughout all the years of a child's life. My friend, a mother does not expect or want to outlive their own child, their own children. Mary did not expect to outlive her beloved son, Jesus. Yet here she stands at the foot of the cross and witnesses life draining away from him. The words of the elder Simeon echoes again in her ears. A sword will pierce your soul also. Compassion meets compassion. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, this day we hear the words of Jesus to be compassionate to those who are entrusted to our care. May his example of providing a home through John for his mother after his death be a symbol that we too are to provide care and compassion to those entrusted to us. We ask this prayer, prayer today in and through the name of Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of pleading. In Jesus' cry, may we hear our own words of despair when we feel absent from your presence. May we know when our hearts are heavy and surrounded by darkness that our cries may be lifted to you even when we feel we are forgotten. Amen. The Gospel of Matthew at chapter 27, verses 45 and 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are the words that stand out for me from this passage, probably for many of us. In a more familiar, more gentler tone, if you will, more subdued tone, while on the cross, Jesus speaks to the others on either side of him, despite their crimes, and tells them they will be in paradise. He speaks to his disciples and his mother. In spite of his ongoing suffering, the care and compassion we know of him is still there. We would have given up long ago, long before in the place, in his place, and certainly would not be considering the feelings of others. But then, in what seems an uncharacteristic moment for Jesus, he, in his completely exhausted and depleted state, cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are not the words we would expect from Jesus, even perhaps from the cross. He has preached and taught and talked about the ever-abiding, steadfast presence and love of God throughout his ministry. With his very actions, he demonstrated this. He took time to pray and nurtured his relationship with God so very aware that God was with him. He told his followers, his listeners, about that abiding, steadfast presence and love of God. Until now, it seems. Of course, we can understand or at least appreciate where this cry of helplessness comes from in his humanity. He has been betrayed, denied, accused, beaten, crucified, and is now hanging on a cross. Our humanity expects to hear some verbal anguish. How could we not under these circumstances? But then this is Jesus. So where was God? that in his deepest of needs and most agonizing time, he felt abandoned, deserted, and rejected. What is described as the darkest hours in the life of Jesus, for that moment he felt he was alone. There was no one on earth to help, or comfort, 
and it seems heaven itself had turned a deaf ear to his cry that Christ himself acknowledges God had abandoned him. In the book, Prayer, Parables, and Promises, Daily Devotions by Martha Martin, she tells a story in reference to Luke 22, verses 42 and 44, where we hear, Jesus says, if you are willing, God, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Martin writes about the idea that Jesus felt the discomforts of being human, physical, emotional, and even spiritual discomforts such as cold and hunger, fear and loneliness. Martin then tells about her favorite Christmas book called Angela and the Baby Jesus by Frank McCourt. It is a story about McCourt's mother who, as a young child, kidnaps the baby Jesus from the nativity scene on the church lawn. She thinks he is cold. She brings him home and tucks him in her bed. But she can't keep the secret, and soon the family knows that she took baby Jesus, and they are shocked. But... All she wanted to do was keep baby Jesus warm on a cold winter's night. Martin says, sometimes we get, up in the, get caught up in the theology of sacrifice in Holy Week that we miss that human part of the story. That part where Jesus felt alone and afraid in the Garden of Gethsemane when his disciples couldn't stay awake and keep watch, when everyone around him let him down, he prayed to God. He prayed because this was the culmination of his mission and ministry. He was aware of the road that he had taken and was still willing to proceed for the people for all of us, for our redemption, our reconciliation, and our relationship with God, so that we would have abundant life and hopefully would always remember the richness of his grace and his love, and that he would give up his life for the forgiveness of sin, and we would appreciate that abundant life and continue the ministry that he gives to us, that we would love one another as he loved us. And here we are, at the foot of the cross, and we hear Jesus cry out. He was there because people colluded to get rid of him, because he was a threat to the powers that be, because they could not understand a better, kinder, and thoughtful world and way to treat others. And on that cross, we hear that echo of temptation from the wilderness as he cried out, in the depths of his agony, was he being challenged yet again? Well, if he is the Son of God, let's wait to see if someone will save him. But we are at the foot of the cross because Jesus understood that the Son of God, the Son of Man, came to serve and not to be served. His place on the cross was the ultimate revelation of God's love, God's grace, and God's reconciliation. It has to be thought-provoking. Yet, it rattles the brain, the heart, and the soul 
that such an extravagant gift of love be given to each and every one of us. I read somewhere, it was put like this, it's a, a good news, bad news story, like life itself. Bad news, Jesus died in our place. Good news, Jesus died in our place. To some degree, we have all abandoned someone in our lives, just as simply as the time when we moved out on our own, when we might have had to leave everything that was familiar. As immigrants and refugees know all too well. And as well, many people have felt abandoned for some reason throughout their lifetime. And there is that wide range of feelings and emotions that accompany this. And yes, there are many that have felt they have been abandoned by God at some point along the journey, perhaps at that darkest moment as well. I have my own stories and experiences, as I'm sure some or many of you have had. There are well-known figures in the Bible that have also felt this. David, who wrote so many Psalms, wrote in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? He too felt abandoned by God because of the personal tragedies in his life. Similarly, Job also experienced many personal tragedies lost his farm, his family, everything, and he felt abandoned by God. And Job was angry with God. But David was a believer in God, and he clung to God in the midst of it all, as did Job. What we know is what David, Job, and Jesus also knew. In our worst situations, although we rant and we vent and even get angry at God and ask where God is, we still cling to God. Preacher Charles Spurgeon in England, 1872, said, It is easy to believe in God when life smiles on you. But it is much more difficult to believe when life frowns on you. Life can be incredibly hard, and there have been very dark days in human history. Even though the words of Jesus that seem to ask, where is God, this is not the end. Just as they weren't for David, who went on to write the 23rd Psalm, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Job, who said, I know my Redeemer lives. Jesus says, it is finished, my work is done, his work is done, salvation made possible, And he committed his spirit into God's hands, for he had that ultimate trust in God and God's love. Jesus knew God was with him. We know that God was there, most certainly also in agony for what Jesus was enduring. But God was there. We know that God was there and is there with us with each step of our journeys. If we were to read further in the passage from Scripture and listen to the words, as he breathed his last, all creation responded, all creation, God's creation, as the earth shook and rocks split, The dead were raised. We cannot help but respond to his sacrifice for us. Yes, God is there. Throughout my own journey to this day, it is the hope that I feel that that light, God's light, the light of Christ, our guide and our support, 
is always there, that light of love. There's a quotation inscribed in a ghetto in Poland from World War II, and it says, I believe in the sun when it is not shining. I believe in the stars when I cannot see them. And I believe in God when I cannot hear God. In our moments of darkness, it is hard to comprehend the glimmer of light, but it is there. And it is out of the deepest darkness that the light is the brightest. And I read in a blog some time ago that the writer says, it is hard to know hope and light at our worst times, but the light is there. We can't see it because we are facing the darkness head on and we are preoccupied with it and fighting it. But on that threshold, we begin to see the light and the hope. And we see it and it is amazing. And remember what the centurion said, truly this man was God's son. For him, this was the glimmer. For us, it is just the beginning of something also tremendously amazing, which Jesus, in his love and his trust in God, also knew. And as I was reminded a couple of weeks ago, sitting here in church, of that couple of verses from Lamentations, but at this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And as we know from John 3, for God so loved the world, God gave his son so that the world may have abundant and eternal life. God is with us. God is always with us. Let us pray. In the darkness of this day, O oh God of mercy, help us quiet the inner cauldron of emotions that we feel when we ponder Jesus' cross. Help us receive the gift of your unspeakable grace and love that Jesus not only offers, but demonstrates for us plainly on this Good Friday. Too often we cry out in our pain, feeling forsaken, but in the confidence of faith, may we grasp the eternal promises you have given us in Jesus Christ. Guide us always in your holy presence. In faith and trust, we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of need. In Jesus' word, let us hear the voice of those who thirst for physical refreshment and spiritual nourishment. Even as we would reach out to quench Jesus' thirst, may we reach out to all who hunger and thirst. Amen. Reading from John's Gospel from the 19th chapter, the 28th and 29th verses. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Four or five weeks ago, I missed an important clergy breakfast gathering. At that time, they were deciding what to do with Holy Week and who would host the Good Friday service. (laughs) Having not been there, (laughs) I received an email from Reverend Oliver. Sorry, we missed you at the meeting. We don't have anyone to host Good Friday. We're wondering if either Mount Pearl or you folks would do it. And foolish like I spoke with David before I answered, and foolish like David said, sure, we're willing. And I responded back that we would host the service. Now, I don't say this, I'm not making light, but if anyone has ever worshipped with me, They know that I am not a fan of heavy clothing in a sanctuary that's warm. I have a tendency to sweat like nothing else and to be overcome with thirst. And I'm lucky today. I have a jug of water. And unlike you, I can now have a sip. (laughs) But we all know what it's like at times to be uncomfortable. I like sitting up here for worship because I have a cushion on my seat. Sitting down in that pew next to Bill Bartlett, I was uncomfortable. (laughs) But it's a very real reaction. And when we were uh, lining up our our preachers, the word that, that was left for me to preach on was the word that I bring to you now. I am thirsty. And and I've pondered that that word, wondering, you know, how do we approach this topic? Because we have in our faith journey, a tendency to to focus on the divine nature of Jesus. We believe Jesus as Christians to be fully human, fully God. And when things get challenging, oftentimes we, we tend to focus on the divine nature. And I've been thrilled today as I've been listening to our preachers talking about that human aspect. And I think that the two words that seem to reflect um, the more human side that come to us from the cross are the words that that Deneen just preached on and and also the word that that I've been asked to, to expound upon. The others carry within them a a sense of of grace, a sense of a a hinting of the divine. But in this word in particular, we are 
witness to physical anguish. I, I try not to go into great detail about what crucifixion involves, but there is no doubt that it was indeed the worst manner of death at that time. And it was designed to be just that. The Romans used it as a deterrent. They wanted anyone who witnessed a crucifixion to understand that they should take any step necessary to avoid facing death by crucifixion. It was agonizing. It was slow. It wasn't so much the, the nails that caused your death. You died of asphyxiation. Not being able to support your head any longer. And you, you literally suffocated. That is the death that Jesus experienced. But not just that. Because before he even got to that stage, he experienced brutality uh, that, that we could barely fathom. Being whipped 39 times. Then being paraded through the streets, carrying his cross to his place of execution. Then being nailed to it. Then being lifted up. And after a couple of hours on the cross, in the hot sun, he speaks those words. I am thirsty. Of course, he was thirsty. He was parched. He was in anguish. When we look at Jesus and we hear his words, we hear an expression of Christ's full understanding of, of our needs as human beings. When we come to the cross, we have to come with the understanding that we, we should focus our attention upon the human nature of Christ that is nailed to that tree. Not the divine. If we look at the figure of Christ on the cross as being fully God, it doesn't hold the same depth of meaning for us. We come to an understanding of just how well Christ does know us. James, when, when he was speaking and and I, I, was, I was thrilled. I, I loved listening to your, your thoughts. Rather than focusing on paradise, focused upon the relationship that was established. In the same way, Bill, when, when you spoke, you spoke to the relationship between Jesus and his mother and the disciple whom he loved. But in order to establish those kind of relationships... Jesus had to have a full understanding of, of what it means to be human. And sometimes we overlook that. Sometimes we overlook the fact that at the grave of his friend Lazarus, knowing full well that he could raise him and would raise him, was touched by human emotion. And he wept. How when he went to the temple and saw the money changers, he was filled with rage and anger to overturn them. How when he was facing death upon the cross, he felt distant from God. As if even God had forsaken him. And there in his suffering, he experienced the very real human need to have his thirst quenched. If even for just the briefest of respite. When I heard the words and started looking at them, 
I, I, I pondered that, that aspect of it. John, when he introduces it, says, uh, so that scripture would be fulfilled, tries to introduce that, that holy nature of Jesus into it. And the scripture that he's referring to are the Psalms in which uh, the psalmist writes, you know, I, 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 I am thirsty. My, my tongue clings to the roof of my mouth. It talks about that anguish. And John, in his inference, wants people to know that this Jesus is indeed the one that was spoken of throughout all of Scripture. But as we gather at the foot of the cross, it is a reminder that the one who we call Lord and Savior is one who knows us intimately, who has experienced all that we experience, our joys, our sorrows, our struggles, our smooth times. And it is because Christ knows us that our relationship is allowed to deepen and to take hold. It is because Jesus thirsted that our thirsts can be quenched. It is because Jesus suffered from brutality, suffered the anguish of loss, suffered the anguish of pain, that we are able to be comforted. It is because of that death on the cross that we are allowed to live. Let us pray. Our loving God, we too thirst. We thirst in many ways. But the one that usually speaks to us most is that physical need we experience in our lives. To have something to drink, to refresh us, to renew us, to help us to carry on. We hear that you thirsted. And we know that you are aware of our need. As we journey with you, may we draw strength in that knowledge that we are not foreign to you and you are not foreign to us. Amen. Scorned by the world.
Let us pray. As we gather now before the cross, O God, let us hear the word of acceptance. As Jesus recognized the time had come and placed himself in your hands, may we know also that throughout our struggles and challenges, you are with us. Amen. And reading from the gospel according to John. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It is finished. The crucifixion of Jesus was a public spectacle. There are plenty of dreadful ways to kill someone in private, but the crucifixion was a show. It was something to watch. They took him out to a place called the skull. They probably called it that because that's where they killed people. And the place called the Skull was next to the road that led into the city so that everyone could see. That is why they killed people there, because they wanted people to see. What do you see when you look at the cross? What does it mean? Pilate made it very clear what the cross was supposed to mean. He hung a sign on it that said so. 
Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He put it in three languages, lest there be any confusion. And Pilate meant it as an insult to the whole Jewish people. Here is your king. His reign is finished. That's because the thing about the cross, crucifixion was well known, but it was considered distasteful even to talk about it. There are plenty of awful things that we're all aware of in our culture, but it would be impolite, even obscene for us to bring them up at coffee hour. That's what the cross was. There wasn't a standard procedure for doing it. Because of Christian art, we tend to picture a vertical pole with a little crossbar halfway down. But crosses could be shaped like a capital T or a Y or an X. They could just be a pole. People were crucified head up and head down with ropes or nails or both. The ancient Greeks just nailed people to boards. The Roman statesman Cicero called the cross the most cruel and horrible penalty. But it wasn't the most extreme because it hurt the most, though I guess you could make a case. The pain is mostly what we focus on today, that the cross hurt and that Jesus was willing to be hurt for us. But in Jesus' day, physical pain was a regular companion to almost everyone. No Tylenol, no general anesthetic. People lived with pain in ways that we cannot even begin to conceive of. I'm not saying Jesus' suffering was insignificant. What I'm saying is that the physical agony of the cross was just one ingredient in an overall recipe of humiliation. What made crucifixion crucifixion was that it was death by suspension. That was the perversity of the cross. No matter what shape it took, there were three elements. Gravity, time, and visibility. Gravity, it was your own body weight that killed you in the end. Time. It wasn't death in an instant. It could take hours or even days for your lungs or your heart to give way. And visibility. People watched it happen. Nobody was crucified in private. That was the point. The watching was the point. Crucifixion was the most extreme penalty because it made a person into a thing. Crucifixion turned a him into an it. It was a spectacle of dying. We're all dying, of course. To be alive is to be moving toward the grave, but we don't say that someone's dying, like actively dying, until we can see what it is that is going to kill them, whether it be a terminal diagnosis, a fatal wound. And the cross takes that moment where you know how the story ends, but not exactly when, and it stretched it out in public. About four decades after Jesus, some Jewish refugees were captured trying to escape the besieged city of Jerusalem. And the Roman general Titus let his troops blow off steam by crucifying the captives in front of the city walls. He thought that the sight might get the city to surrender. They crucified 500 people a day. They ran out of crosses for people, and they ran out of room for crosses along the road. It turned into a frenzy. As the Reverend Dr. Tyler Wig Stevenson put it, the soldiers were just nailing people to wood in whatever poses they could imagine, like children torturing Barbies. Death on a cross turned people into objects, and even less than that, it turned people into signs. It took living people, unique souls with personalities and families and stories of their own that we had never seen before and we will never see again, and nailed them to wood, and that is where their stories ended. 
It made them billboards where the message was, this is dirt. This is meat. This is not a life. This is garbage. This is not a person. Look what we can do. And the deeper message of the sign was cry all you want because heaven is empty and no one is coming to take you down. That is why Roman citizens could not be crucified. It was a punishment reserved entirely for the lower class and especially for slaves. It was known as the slave's death, the special punishment for somebody whose body already belonged to someone else. This is no person. This is not a life. This is garbage. This dirt is the king of the Jews and he is finished. That is the spectacle which Pilate intended. That is the show. That is the sign he wrote. That is what he wanted people to see. The passion narratives spare us many of the gory details of crucifixion. Yes, we hear that the cross was a spectacle of dying in shame, but we do not get every bloody detail because the people who originally heard the gospel, they knew that already. This is an audience that knew crucifixion like you and I know scam calls from Amazon. They walked past crosses on their daily commute. They knew how obscene it was. And the gospels tell us, you know, this horrible, this despicable thing, this thing that we all know about, but we don't talk about. That happened to Jesus. It is hard for us to look away. We try to look through it. We try to look past it, but ultimately we do have to look right at it. And when we do, we discover what the cross was and what exactly was finished that day. We've already heard this afternoon of the glorious, hideous things that happened there. Things of both beauty and shame. We know that Christ suffered in community sacrificed between two others and in front of his loved ones, that he ensured his mother would be cared for, that he cried out, that he thirst. And a critical detail that we often overlook because it's not in any of our art, that Jesus was naked. Jesus was naked on the cross. The soldiers gambled for his clothes after they crucified him, including his tunic, his undergarment. They stripped him completely. From the time of Eden, we have made garments to cover ourselves. And we all cover ourselves to greater and lesser degrees. But as we are comfortable, we choose, we decide which parts of ourselves other people get to see. And to take that away from a person, to expose someone against their will, is a fundamental violation. And that happened to Jesus. They exposed Jesus, his hands nailed wide, so there was nothing he could do to cover himself except darken the very sky. They exposed him. They did it to Jesus in the sight of his loved ones. They did it in front of his mom. They stripped Jesus entirely, and the people who loved Jesus the most, his mother, his aunt, his friend Mary, the disciple whom he loved, they stayed near. The sheer meanness of it. Think about the cruelty of this. Because paintings of the cross often show Jesus high in the air, well above the onlookers who are beneath his feet. But the standard Roman cross, the low cross, only lifted the condemned a foot off the ground. And the high cross, which amplified the disgrace, lifted them three feet off the ground. And it seems from the detail in the word that Reverend Bill just shared with us of the sponge on a stick, that that was probably the height Jesus was at. So this is the mind shattering cruelty of the cross. Imagine yourself there, your beloved nailed to a pole, naked, three feet off the ground. 
which is to say their waist at eye level. And you're there. Of course you are there. You're not going to leave them to die alone, but it could take hours. It could take days. How do you pass the time? Where do you look? You don't want to violate him further with your gaze, but are you going to look away from him in his final moments? You see others looking, just passing by, their world's not ending, just commuters glancing at a billboard, gawking at your beloved with mean, mean eyes, and there's nothing that you can do about it. You can't look away, and you can't look. It is no secret that Christians have always had trouble looking at the cross. It is that horrifying Think about how the crucifixion has been painted and sculpted. The Jesus we know from images is stripped, yes, but almost always with a loincloth guarding his most basic privacy. But that's not how it happened. And what that means is that the literal truth of the cross, this thing that we say our salvation depended on, the literal truth of the cross as it happened is so obscene that Christians have had to edit it and clean it up and censor it and sanitize it in order for us simply to picture it for 2,000 years. But a sanitized cross is not a saving cross. Because it is precisely the obscenity of the cross that saves us. Does that shock you to hear? Because it shocks me to say. The obscenity of the cross, a human being made in the image of God, rendered into an object for display, saves us. And the only reason that this horrible, horrendous, obscene act of violence saves us is because of who is on display. For the person hanging on the cross is not just another nameless soul among the countless victims of history. No, the person humiliated in this way, the person who the Romans made into garbage, meat, dirt, the person rendered obscene, is the word of God made flesh. It is a miraculous thing for God to do. It shows us that there is no place, no situation where our God will not go for us. There is nothing our God will not endure for us. We know of other signs and symbols, but this sign of him on the cross is perhaps the most miraculous that we know. Sure, on face value, it is the most ordinary. People die all of the time. But when we know who is dying, it almost makes walking on water look like a parlor trick. For of course, the creator of the universe has control over their creation. Of course, the God who made water can turn it into wine. The God who made bodies can heal them and even give them life. But this death on the cross is something else. It finishes something. And it is precisely that which Christ enters into, the obscenity, the shame of the cross that shows us what is finished this day. And perhaps that obscenity is deeply uncomfortable to us. Maybe we recoil from this. Perhaps this sermon is deeply offensive to you because we want to protect him. We want to defend him, his honor, his glory. Our love of Jesus can make us want to make the cross in, into, you know, noble masculine suffering like Mel Gibson dying at the end of Braveheart. Because we can handle Jesus being hurt for us. That just shows how tough he is. You can write songs about pain. It's a lot more difficult to write songs about shame. But the cross is emptied of its power when we try to cover up what Jesus exposed for us. When we force on him the very dignity which he gave up. When God came to earth, it was not just for the noble and joyous and happy parts of the human experience. He went all the way down to the dregs. And that's where he died. And that, my friends, is why the cross saves us. 
because it shows us that there is no limit to the reach of God's love. At no point will God pull back or recoil from being with us. We have now seen that there is no limit to where the love of God extends. There is no doubt of how far God will go. It is no longer up for debate. With arms outstretched, God embraces the absolute totality of the human experience. You tell me what falls outside of that embrace. It is finished. At the cross, God grips the whole universe, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he embraces it all. The power of sin and death is defeated. Love has conquered because they have nothing left to threaten. Because in the obscenity of his death is the very love of God. His work is complete. There is nowhere God will not go. There is nothing God will not experience. There is nothing our God will not endure. God has completed it all. It is finished. Let us pray. God of passionate and vulnerable love, whose body broken on the cross rebukes us still, save us, hold us, and forgive us, that you as victor and victim might lead us from death to life. Through Jesus Christ, the exposed and crucified. Amen. Let us pray. 
As we gather now before the cross, O oh God, let us hear a word of understanding and trust. On the mountain tops and in the deepest valleys, let us know, as Jesus did, that we are always in your care and that nothing shall ever separate us from you. Our Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, reading verses 44 to 46. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the tent pole was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said that, he breathed his last. So here we are on Good Friday, the last word. And after hearing all these wonderful preachers, I'm a little bit nervous because I usually like to say, I love the last word. You can ask my husband, Scott. I do enjoy the last word. And I thought before today started, how good. I won't even give my good friend Oliver the last word today. <laughs> it's a challenging word. And then I was started thinking about the order of the words. Who decided which gospel text was going to be the first word, the second word, the third words, and so on. And I've long thought that word number six should be the last word. It is finished. It's complete. Done. So why did they put this word last? And as I reflected on the text and what Jesus said, and in that moment, what was going on, you think about it. The whole world had turned dark. It says in our gospel that the sun stopped shining. It was darkness that covered the land from noon until about three in the afternoon. And then the curtain of the temple was torn in two. It's like uh, we heard earlier, all of creation was crying out that something significant has happened. And when, for a while, when I was thinking about this text, I was thinking that Jesus was saying this quietly, like a prayer. But no, the gospel writer is very clear, in a loud voice. And we've heard about the torture that Jesus experienced that day and the pain he was in in that moment. How did he, how did he even have the air in his lungs to have a loud voice in which to cry? But somehow, Jesus found his voice, and he cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then he breathes his last. And as I reflected on the text, I decided that it was the last word because Jesus is giving God the last word. Because the story isn't over. God is not finished with this moment yet. It is not complete. Our liturgy tells us this. We started this service, little did you know, maybe, last night at Gower Street and Monday, Thursday, and we continue it today. There is no benediction. The story is not over until Easter Vigil on Saturday night at St. James or your Easter Sunday morning service when the benediction is pronounced because God indeed has the last word. And God's word is always a word of love. We have things that we need to offer to God. Aren't there hardships and challenges we face? We can look at the world writ large. We face wars in so many countries. And the images of the people suffering horrify me. And if we think about our planet, this place we call home, and the environmental crisis we're facing, that's a pretty big challenge. Bill mentioned it earlier, and I see it in my work every day, the housing crisis. Every province, every place, every country, people have no place to live. And there's not enough food to, for people to eat. The pinch is real for so many people in their lives. And if we look at our own lives, how many of us have faced 
moments of such great challenge that we don't know where to go and where to turn. We feel that sense of hopelessness, and it can be caused for any number of reasons, whether it's the crisis of loneliness that so many are experiencing, mental health challenges. There are people with new diagnoses, and they think, dear God, how am I going to get through? Or maybe it's a breakdown in a significant relationship. Or maybe it's a fracture of a relationship with a child. There are so many things that can cause us to cry out to God in our need and our pain. And from the cross, Jesus is inviting us, challenging us maybe, to remember that the last word is not ours. God is not finished with us yet. God gets the last word. And God's last word is always a word of hope. And in that very last moment, as Jesus hangs on the cross, he cries out in a loud voice with everything that he has, offering it all to God. Into your hands I commit your spirit. I found as I was reading this text, um, definitions for the word par, uh, parathemi, commit. So to place beside or near, set before, to place down, to deposit, to entrust or commit to one's charge. That's our invitation. As we pause in the silence of the rest of Good Friday and Holy Saturday, to set aside, to deposit, to commit it all to God's care. Because indeed, God has the last word. And that word is a word of hope. It is a word of new life. It is a word of deep and abiding love. Because after all, there is no place we can go where God's love has not already gone. Let us pray. Holy One, we stand before the cross in this time of watching and waiting. Help us remember you aren't finished with us yet. Help us remember that you get the last word. Let us watch and wait for the good news that is to come. Amen.
No story so divine Never was love, dear king Never was grief like thine This is my friend In whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. Let us pray. We come to the cross. We look up. We see the broken Christ. And we pray for those broken in our world. We pray for refugees who have had to flee from their homes and communities. We pray for boys forced to fight and girls forced into prostitution. We pray for those hated by their neighbors or bullied by their peers. We pray for the broken, and God calls us to reflection and action. We come to the cross. We look up. We see the suffering Christ, and we pray for those suffering in our communities. We pray for the homeless and for abused elders. We pray for those we know are sick, for family members and for members of our faith communities. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who have had to put dreams and hopes to one side. We pray for the suffering, and God calls us to reflection and to action. We come to the cross. We look up. We see the abandoned Christ, and we bring to mind those friends who we have left that let them down. We bring to mind those whose fears dominate and control. We bring to mind the unemployed and rejected, children who are not loved. We pray for those abandoned in our world, and God calls us to reflection and to action. We come to the cross, we look up, and Christ looks down at us. We feel reflections of his helplessness. We are aware of those parts of us which are suffering. We know how our faith is tested by adversity. We wish that our friends would be there for us. And as we reflect on our own needs, God calls us to reflection and to faithfulness. Let us gather together all these prayers, bringing them before God and speaking those words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
let us go forth into a hurting world, aware of loss, betrayal, suffering, and tragedy, keenly aware of darkness and death. Let us resolve to resist the powers of evil, apathy, and empire. So we go, knowing the terror of crucifixion and the injustice of popular opinion. We go uncertain and unsure, knowing only that Easter and good news will follow somehow. While we wait for the promise that is to come, we bear a cross of discipleship and discernment. We go into God's Good Friday. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. 